So now we'll do problem four from the practice midterm. And problem four gives you the um, potential solution for spherical symmetry is equal to V of R of theta is the sum from L is equal to zero to infinity A sub L R to the power of L plus B sub L over R to the L plus one multiplied by the Legendre polynomials PL of cosine of theta. So this is the potential that he gives you, and this is um, equation 3.65 in Griffiths. Um, I just have it open here. And so the general solution um, is a linear combination of the separable solutions um, that we find from solving the separated equation r of r theta of theta, where of course our general solution for r of r is a sub l r to the l plus b sub l or r to the l plus one, and our theta of theta are our Legendre polynomials PL cosine of theta. So what this sum means, um, before we get into A, I'm just gonna kind of explain what the sum actually means. Um, it means that we're taking every single value that's possible of L and adding all of those up as a general solution. So our V of R of theta in general could be A zero, R to the zero, plus b0 over r to the 1, because 0 plus 1 is 1, um, times p0 of cosine of theta, plus et cetera, et cetera. So we have the next term, which is a1 r to the 1, plus b1 over r squared, p1 cosine of theta, et cetera, et cetera. So we have every single possible value of l from 0 to infinity, and we expand out our solution like this. Now. What Jason gives us in the question is that the boundary condition at the surface of the sphere, and the sphere has no charge inside, um, so it's a hollow, essentially a hollow conducting sphere, V of R of theta is K P3 cosine of theta. So at the boundary, we're subject to the condition that we must have some constant K multiplied by the third, so L is equal to three, Legendre polynomial. What, what this means is that in this entire sum here, the only term that would appear is the L is equal to three term. Because in order for this to satisfy our boundary conditions, when we set our little r is equal to r, um, we are gonna have every other term appear, but due to the orthogonality and due to the fact that the L, if L is not equal to L prime, the integral goes to zero, as we found in question two, um, we will only end up with the term L is equal to three, which means that this entire sum here, the only term that's left remaining is the L is equal to three term. Now that helps us with part A because part A says, what is the dipole moment of the sphere? Now, if we remember from the multipole expansion, um, which I've written here, some resources you can find some more information on that. We have 3.3C or 3.4 um, in the notes online, so on these slides on D2L, um, or we also can look at problem uh, 3.19 and example 3.6 and 3.7 in Griffiths. Griffiths. Um, so these are some online resources uh, from D2L that you can look more about on the multiple expansion um, and kind of also this, pro this problem. Um, and these are some more examples similar, more to the, the stuff you're gonna be solving in part B. Um, but this is some extra information if uh, you want to do a little bit more studying. Anyways, so back to what we were talking about for part A, we want to find what is the dipole moment of the sphere. Now, if we recall from these slides and from the information, we have if the V is proportional to one over R, so if our um, potential is proportional to one over R, that's called a monopole. If V is proportional to one over R squared, then this is called a dipole. And finally, if R is proportional to one over R cubed, that's a quadrupole, et cetera, et cetera, octopole, and we can move through all the steps of one over R. What we can recognize here is that we're increasing in powers of R in the denominator. And this essentially comes in from our B um, BL over R to the L plus one term in this sum. So if we look when L is equal to zero, we get one over R. When L is equal to one, we have one over R squared. So in this sum, 
we're going to be able to determine whether or not it's a monopole, a dipole, a quadrupole, an octopole, etc., dependent on what the value of this R term here is. So we said that we want a dipole moment, so we want this dipole, so we want the value of this uh, constant, of this coefficient. However, we also know that due to the boundary conditions, we only have the L is equal to 3 term. So this comes, this is 1 over R squared, comes when L is equal to 1, as we see here, when L is equal to 1, which means that we don't actually end up with that term in the sum. We only have the L is equal to 3 term. So our dipole moment is equal to 0. Now this is kind of a little bit confusing for me at first when I first saw it and I was reading the textbook and stuff, so let me um, try to explain a little bit more in depth. Um, again, we have the multiple expansion, which says that our potential can be a sum of the expanding terms of 1 over r plus 1 over r squared plus 1 over r cubed, etc., with some coefficient in front. It's just proportionality. And this we can see in our sum for our general solution of r and theta, so spherical coordinates of our general solution to the separation equation for the potential around a sphere. We can see that this expansion of 1 over r, 1 over r squared, 1 over r cubed comes in of this term here, BL over RL plus 1. The AL, R to the L also contributes a factor, but it's not the expansion term that we see with the R on the denominator. So when we expand out this potential, depending on R and theta, we can see that each component contributes entirely to that sum. And the dipole term, the 1 over r squared term, would be where l is equal to 1 and we have the 1 over r squared and the coefficient would be b1. Now, because of our boundary conditions of the problem in specific to this midterm, we have that v of r and theta, r is capital R, is the um, radius of the sphere, is only dependent on the p3 term which means that only when L is equal to 3 do we have a solution. Because of the orthogonality, and L is not equal to L prime, the integral goes to 0. So there will be no way we can, we can um, compose P3 depending on this dipole term. So when L is equal to 3, we're going to get only an L equals 3 term in the sum, and the L equals 1 will go to 0, which means that our dipole moment and the coefficient of this term is going to be equal to zero. So again, we can do this in a different way, and Jason has it in his solutions using the um, the bound the surface charge uh, sigma, um, which you kind of have to have the solution to part B for first. Um, and I am like a little bit um, less. I understand that one a little bit less. This one is a little bit um, more straightforward for me. So I'm going to stick with this solution and say that yes, if you look at the dipole term um, and this expansion, then that is p is equal to zero according to the orthogonality. Um, but you can also do it the other way uh, based off the solutions and he can probably help you with any of the questions you have doing it that way. Um, you'd have to find the potential inside and outside the sphere first, which is an expansion on part B of this uh, midterm problem. Um, yeah, so dipole moment for part A, P is equal to zero. So in part B of question four, um, we're being asked to find what is the potential inside of the sphere. So the first thing we want to do is we want to simplify this general form of the solution, and then we want to find what, are the, what, are the, what is the potential based off of the boundary condition that Jason gives us, um, which is k p3 of cosine of theta when v is equal to capital R and theta. So in order to start, we'll start with this formula here. And if we are inside the sphere, that means that we consider the point r is equal to zero. Now, if we look at this formula here, when r is equal to zero, this term will go to infinity. So we're going to have um, a, a runaway, a divergent um, potential value at the center r is equal to zero. This can't happen. That's not physically possible. So what we can do right away is say that this reduces our potential, our general form, to just include the values al r to the l, pl cosine of theta. So what we have done is we have said that all BL are equal to zero. And that's again because of the fact that we can't have the one over zero, we can't have the one over R when R goes to zero, which means that we must set all of our coefficients B is equal to zero inside of the sphere. So now we have this general form and we want to apply the boundary conditions. So we can say that when V of R and theta happens, we get essentially the sum L is equal to 0 to infinity, A sub L, capital R to the L, 
PL cosine of theta. And then this is equal to K P3 cosine of theta. And again, similar to in part A, when we said that all of the terms in the sum will go to zero except for where L is equal to three. So due to the orthogonality of the Legendre polynomials, we can only pick out the L is equal to three term, which means that we'll only consider A3 r cubed p3 cosine of theta is equal to k p3 cosine of theta. Once again, it's due to the fact that out of all the terms in this sum, the only one that we will consider is p3 due to the orthogonality of the Legendre polynomials. So the boundary conditions give that, because of the cancellation here of the Legendre polynomials, that a3 is equal to k over r cubed. We can just sub and solve for a3. Now, what that means is in our general solution here, we have v of r and theta, depends dying, v of r and theta. Um, the only term that will remain in the sum is the a3 term. So we can substitute what is a3, it's k of r cubed. And when l is equal to three, we're left with r, little r cubed from the sum, p3 cosine, of theta. So this is the final answer to part B. So again, we found that the, the general form of our potential inside of the sphere, B was equal to zero, all of the BL were equal to zero, so we only considered the AL coefficients. We found that due to the orthogonality of the Legendre polynomials, only the L equals three term will remain in this entire sum. So we have A3 little r cubed P3 of cosine of theta, and then we just found what is A3 due to that boundary condition, substitute that back into the general formula, and we can say that V of R theta is equal to K over R cubed, capital R where R is the radius, little r cubed, P3 cosine of theta. Now in question two, um, in part A, we found what was P3 of X, so we can substitute that in if you'd like, just because you found that in part two, so V3, B, R of theta, K over R cubed, r cubed and it'll be 5 over 2 cosine cubed of theta minus 3 over 2 cosine of theta. If we substitute in for what the actual value of p3 is. So this would be your final general correct uh, solution for the potential inside of the sphere uh, given the conditions on R and theta if we expand and put in the Legendre polynomial P3.